All right, welcome to class. This is on CARPS uh, 21 problems. They aren't necessarily his problems, so to speak. They're just problems he proved something about, uh, and I'll talk about in a second. So first, why study NP completeness? So as a timeline, uh, Cook's paper is around uh, 1971, where he proved the Cook-Levin theorem independently in Russia. Uh, Leonoid Levin sat on this result for some time, and then he proved it. He gave several examples of NP-complete problems. Um, that was, I think, like 1973. There was, you know, Cold War going on. These guys were writing in Russian, and these guys were writing in English, so they're not communicating that well. Uh, later on in America, uh, Richard Karp published in 1972 21 problems that are NP-complete. And these were a set of problems which were of various importance to various different fields of mathematics. They involved graph theory, uh, satisfiability, optimization, all kinds of fields. People that have been studying to speed up algorithms in these fields for a long time, and he proved them all to be NP-complete. So there is some relation among these huge class of well-studied, huge breadth uh, problems. There was a book in uh, 1979 by Gary and Johnson. And these two guys studied NP completeness in their own right. But this book was, is like the, was for its time like the manual on NP completeness. The appendix was almost half the book and it just contained a huge list of NP complete problems and their sources. I'm going to give you one of the arguments uh, why to study N NP completeness uh, which comes in their introduction of this book. Another thing actually quickly to mention to go from publishing in a theorem to publishing in a book very quickly eight years I don't know if a theorem even today gets into a book that fast. To me that says you know this was really important. It did shake up quite a few things. Anyway, onward, uh, let's suppose that you're like in your boss's office, right? And he's hired you. This is what your boss is going to look like, right? Okay, so this is your boss and then this is you and you're in your boss's office and he's hired you to solve some problem and he's like, I need you to optimize uh, how many this is, how many things we can produce per second with these resources. You know, come up with an efficient algorithm for it, right? He's here. He's in the business of making money, so he tells you solve this problem so I can make more money. And then you're like, uh, okay, so you go work on it for a really long time, and then you fail. So you really have. Uh, there's a few options you could do here if you fail at work. You could go to him and you could say something like, uh, well, I'm just too stupid to solve this. I'm not going to do it. I failed. And then what would he do? He's going to fire you. Obviously, you're in a right to work state. You're not making him any money. Why is he, what is he paying you for? So that's a bad idea. Don't go to him and say you failed. You could not find an efficient algorithm. Instead, what you might be interested in doing is proving intractability. So that the algorithm was somehow not able to be done efficiently, right? You need some obscene number of steps to solve it, okay? And you could prove it. You could go to him all angry and it's like your fault now. You could say, I can't find an algorithm because one doesn't exist. However, proving a problem is intractable is actually incredibly difficult. I would say it's actually harder than finding an efficient algorithm. So maybe you can't do that. Maybe you don't have the ability to do that. Fine, so you sit on that. But what you can do is is a, a sort of compromise between these two. So if you can prove the problem is NP complete. So you say uh, proving your problem is NP complete is like saying I can't solve it 
And by solve, I mean find an efficient algorithm. Uh, but neither can any of these famous people. And then out the door is like a line of uh, famous people or whatever, right? So there's a guy and he's, stand he's waiting in line to tell your boss that he can't solve it. They're not getting smaller, they're getting farther away, right? So if you rela relate th this problem the boss gave you to all the other problems, then coming up with a, if you prove it's NP complete, you have proved essentially that if I could have found an efficient algorithm for it, I could have also proven uh, P does equal NP. And then I could have gone on and claimed a million dollar prize and I could have quit this job. Obviously, since I didn't do that, uh, we don't believe there is an efficient algorithm. So this is kind of the same, sort of this uh, compromise here. All right, let's get some notation out the way. We proved uh, sat is NP complete. This is sometimes called unrestricted sat. This is in comparison to something called CNF set. Uh, CNF sat. So CNF sat, sat, this stands for conjunctive normal form. Conjunct, can I spell uh, normal form? So uh, we say that x1 dot 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 to xn or uh, x bar 1 dot 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 x bar n, right? So that any of these or its complements, these are called literals. We say a clause is the or of several literals. So we have like x1 or x2 bar or dot dot dot, let's say xk bar. Let's just say xk. So a clause is equal to the or of literals. Uh, a Boolean formula is in CNF form if it is the AND of clauses. So if uh, it's equal to the AND of CI, uh, let's say I equals 1 to some K. So it's the AND of K clauses. Each CI clause. Uh, we say... Uh, uh, phi is in CNF form. Examples of this would be like x1 or x2 and not x1 or x3 or something, right? So in this example, both clauses have length 2. It doesn't particularly matter. I could also add a clause of a single thing, x2. The reason this formula is interesting, this kind of structure is interesting is because you can think of this like you have to satisfy each of these clauses and then each so all of them have to be satisfied you have a set of conditions to satisfy but then for each one to satisfy you can choose one out of each right so if you chose this x3 for example then you could somehow maybe maybe not choose something else somewhere that's the reason this form has has some interest so we proved sat we proved uh cook the Cook-Levin theorem that sat is NP complete for the unrestricted version of sat, but we could modify the proof uh, to show that CNF sat is NP complete, right? So modify the Cook-Levin theorem to show that CNF sat, uh, which is equal to the set of all Boolean formulas such that phi is uh, in it's in CNF form and is satisfiable. Is NP complete? I'll let you work through that as an exercise. Sipser gives a very high level paragraph about uh, the idea of it. You may recall that the that our Boolean formula was the AND 
four things. So we are, we already have our uh, ways to break it down, and then each of those you can show them as the and of several clauses. It's, it's actually almost there. So consider what we call three set. Uh, this is the language of Boolean formulas, such that uh, phi is in C and F. It's satisfiable. And each CI has three variables, three literals, exactly three literals. So, for example, this could be like um, x1 or x2 or x3 and x4 or not x1 or not x2 or and so on. Each one has to have exactly length 3. 3 sat is worth study because it is very simple combinatorially it just it's it has such minimal structure to it compare this to unrestricted set where you know you could have all kinds of things here we have each we have a bunch of objects and each one only has three things in them exactly three things in them so i'm going to prove now uh three set is np complete we're going to reduce uh from set to three set first off is three set in NP. Well, sat was an NP. Unrestricted sat was an NP. So you take that verifier. It should also understand formulas that are in 3 sat form. So that use that same verifier for 3 sat and bam, 3 sat is an NP. So the reduction actually here is from uh, C and F sat. Also, a quick note, you can't really reduce from sat to CNF sat or the other way around because there are some Boolean formulas which to convert to CNF sat have exponential blow up. Some very weird edge cases you can come up with. So to prove CNF sat was NP complete, you would have to do uh, a modified version of the Cook Levin theorem. So how we're going to do uh, let uh, uh, phi equal, let's say, clauses C1 and dot 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 and ck uh where each c1 to ck is of some length right so if i'll say ci is of length one then we have something like uh a we can replace that with the three clause a or a or a what if the clause has uh two elements so we have a or b uh, so this could is equivalent to A or B or A. What if the clause is length 3? We don't change it. What if the clause has length 4 or more? Well, well I'm going to show you to take two literals of a clause and expand it into multiple clauses. So we're going to have, uh, let's say, two elements of our clause were A or B, and we're going to make this equivalent to some C. Right, so logically recall that uh, P implies Q is uh, equivalent to not P or Q. So we're going to basically do the same thing for both directions. Uh, C implies A or B. This is equivalent to not C or A or B. Bam, it's in three form. Then we have to do the other way. So we have to A or B implies C. So this is going to be equal to uh, not A or B or C, which is equivalent to A, not A, and B, and not B, uh, or C. And now we need to distribute this again, so we're going to get, we're going to get something terrible like a or uh, not B or C and not A or B or C and, and uh, not A or not B and C. So you and these three clauses with 
uh, this clause, and you get something logically equivalent to uh, th the things. But we've now reduced the original clause that had four or more literals to now we replace the A, U, A or B in that clause to three. For each clause of four or more, we remove one literal from it and increase the number of clauses. This is by a polynomial knot. It's not some crazy exponential thing. So what we have now is that some uh, Boolean formula is going to be in CNF sat if and only if our transformation here is in uh, 3 sat. This is by definition a uh, reduction. So 3 sat is NP complete. Okay, now let's do an interesting language. That's enough with Boolean formulas for now. The language clique is a graph theoretic one. This is a combinatorial problem. This is the set of all graphs and some integer k such that g has a k clique. Uh, you may need to refresh yourself on some graph theory. A k clique is a subgraph of size k, which is complete. A complete subgraph of uh, size k so we we'll, we can prove that clique is np complete by reduction from uh, three set so so let uh, phi be some formula in three set And phi is going to look like it's going to have some clauses C1 uh, and dot 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 uh, to some CK, let's say K, for each CI form, form a triple of uh, vertices in G. So it's going to look like this for each uh, uh, triple. And let's just suppose there's four. There's four clauses. Uh, for all uh, VI and VJ in uh, G, each triple, by the way, is uh, one element, vertex is per literal in the clause right and they're denoted by uh the literal here so this if uh let's say we had x1 or not x2 or x3 we would write this as x1 or not x2 or x3 so for all v i and v j in g uh put the edge v i v j uh, in E, or I should say in V here, excuse me. Recall the graph has a set of vertices and edges. So we put every possible edge in E except two things. One, if VI, VJ are in the same triple. Two, if VI, VJ are like uh, some XI and uh, not XI. So they can't be the same symbol knotted. They can be the same symbol in different triplets. So what we're going to do is we're going to like put a bunch of edges. Yeah, who knows how exactly this is going. Right. Now I claim then that uh, phi is in 3 sat. Uh, if and only if this uh, graph and k, where k is the number of triples. So we have a clique of size k is in a clique. So what's our proof? Suppose 
that this uh, formula in three set had a satisfying assignment. That means in each clause, some element was true. So then pick that set of vertices corresponding in the graph G. That will form a clique. Those are exactly K vertices. Let's suppose two elements of a clause were true, then you just pick one arbitrarily. It actually doesn't matter. You have a bigger clique than it turns out, but suppose, let's not consider it. Let's say this one, this one, this one, and this one. You know, whatever. Those will form a clique. If you go the reverse way, you say, well, suppose G has some clique. You take each element of the triple. They have to be, if the clique is size K, it has to take one element of each triple. So then that's your satisfying assignment. There's no way G has a clique unless uh, Phi also has a, a satisfying assignment. So this is an if and only if relation. So this shows then that 3sat is reducible to clique. We have a really good graph theory problem here now, clique. That can help us show a lot more graph theory, a lot more graph theoretic NP complete problems. Oh, important. I forgot to show that clique was an NP. So far, all I've actually shown is that it's NP hard. So it's clique and NP. Our certificate is then a graph. You just check that each one is connected to each other. There's N squared possible edges in this K clique. So it's an NP. Consider the language called vertex cover, which is the encodings of some graph in an integer k such that uh, there exists a subset v prime of v such that uh, v prime has size k and each edge in uh, the set of edges touches some v in uh, v prime. So basically, you have a set of vertices, some subset of vertices of size k, such that every edge is touching one of these vertices. It's like literally a vertex cover. So if you have, like, for example, a star graph. The vertex cover, the smallest vertex cover, is this. This is a decision variant of a search problem. Usually the question is phrased like, find the smallest vertex cover. This is like, you know, we're talking about languages here, decision problems, so we have to say, ah, some size k. So we're going to reduce this problem, uh, I'll call it vc, uh, to clique. This is actually an if and only if relation, and that'll make sense in the uh, reduction. So first of all, is vertex cover in NP? Yes, there's N squared edges. You have some K. You can just uh, loop through each vertex, see if it's in your set V. If it is, good for you. Keep going. The reason this is an, this uh, reduction goes both ways, because if uh, some V subset of V, some V prime subset of V is a K clique, of G is a K clique of G, then uh, V prime complement, which is recalls just V minus V prime, uh, is a vertex cover of G complement. To give you an example of this, say we had some ugly graph, like uh, I don't know something like this. So that's going to be your clique of size four. Let's say we had some extra add-ons or something. So our, our clique here is these four vertices. Uh, we take the complement of V and we take the complement of G. So the complement of a graph, by the way, is every edge not in G is now in G and every edge in G is now not in G. So our transformation is going to be we're going to have four independent vertices. Then these two at the bottom are going to connect to almost everything. So those are going to go like that. They're going to go like that. Our 
vertex cover then is going to be the complements is going to be these these two and look at that every edge is touching a vertex uh, in our in our cover g comma k is in clique if and only if g complement comma k is in a vertex cover It's not so fun to formulate this next one as a language, so I'm just going to write it like a problem. Uh, set cover, we have some U is some universal set, so we'll say X1 dot 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 to XN, and we say uh, let uh, S1 dot 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 to some like SK uh, be subsets of U. So we're given our set of subsets. Uh, does there exist uh some c which is a subset of uh one to k so basically a selection of these subsets uh such that the union of our subsets our choice subsets so i is in c is equal to u basically we have some rig some choice of subsets does there exist a selection among those uh subsets which can cover the universe you you might be jumping out of your pants to realize that this is actually a generalization of vertex cover so we should reduce from vertex cover is it is uh first off is is set cover in np yes the certificate is going to be c and it's going to say you know we can check if it has sizes at most k and then we can take the union in polynomial time. We just count all the elements and see that if we have all n elements, we're good. So it, it's kind of obviously an NP. That's, that's the way it goes for most of these problems. Here's how the reduction goes. We're going to let u equal the set of edges. So we're going to let si equal the uh, set of edges incident to the vertice vi. v is equal to some v1 dot 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 to some vn of uh, vertices incident to vi it would actually be instead of vertices it would be uh the elements of u but it should be clear we want uh some vi is in our vertex cover if and only if i is in our set cover uh so uh let uh, v prime be a vertex cover of G and let's say that V has size K then uh, if if some little u is in u this corresponds to uh, some V I uh, V J in E because E is constructed to be the universe so either uh, vi or vj is in our vertex cover v prime so either uh, i or j is in c so u is going to be in some si or sj so u is going to be in our uh, vertex cover in our set cover Since this is for all u, uh, c is a set cover. The converse actually works fine too. You know, we could say this is a set cover if and only if uh, v prime was a vertex cover. Okay, a related problem to clique is actually called independent set. This asks for a graph uh, g and some size k and it asks uh if uh, g has a set v of vertices of size k where no vertices 
in V prime share an edge. They are uh, quite literally independent. You may think of an independent set in a graph, sort of like an anti-clique, if that makes sense. A set of vertices which n share no edges in the graph complement that implies that those set of vertices would all share edges between each other. And that's, you know, by definition, a clique. So what we can do is we can reduce clique to independent set. And this is perhaps one of the easiest reductions. It's not even, this is not even given by CARP, it's just sort of almost uh, obvious. I'm proving this because when we prove other NP, NP complete problems, perhaps it's easier to reduce to independent set than clique, for example. So if, if G comma K is in uh, clique, that implies uh, that G complement K is in uh, independent set. All right. So as a quick example, consider that we had a independent set of vertices like this. All right. So these three are independent. They do not share a vertex. But if we take the dual, uh, excuse me, the complement, well, those three have to share edges now because they didn't share it in the main graph. Then we also have all these other ones. That goes to there, that goes to there, that goes to there, right there, right there, and there. And I guess these go to here too. Yeah. So anyway, it has a clique of size K. It probably has a clique of bigger than K if I care to look to it, but it does have a clique of size K. So that one is, is almost trivial. An important step, obviously, I keep forgetting is that is this is independent set in NP. Yes, because clique was an NP, you can verify uh, that there is a clique of size K in, N in NP. So it's just this, whatever that program would be, you just condition that in instead of looking for edges, it looks for not seeing edges, right? So if you have the, the set of size K, all there's no edges between them in the list. And the set of edges is like N squared and the number of vertices. So, all right, let's talk about another problem called set pack. This is this, uh, you have some, I'll formulate it not as a language, but you have some U, some universal set, you have some X1, dot, 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 XN. You have a family of like S1, dot, 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 SK, each is a subset of U. And uh, you want some uh, selection of, well, you know what I'll say? Because we, we have, let's say, M subsets. And you want to choose k of them, k of them, uh, such that uh, if i does not equal j, then s i intersect s j is equal to the empty set. So you basically are choosing k independent sets. All of them are pairwise disjoint. None of the sets contain, none of the sets share an element with each other. Now, these sets are independent, so you may think, ah, this is NP complete. Obviously, I'm going to reduce to independent set. And you'd be right. I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to reduce from independent set. First, though, let's show it's an NP. Is set pack an NP? Well, each, there's M possible sets. Uh, each of them, pairwise, we're going to check like M squared of them. Uh, and each one could be at most size n, so that's like m squared n. Uh, so yeah, that's a polynomial, right? So set pack is in n p. I'm I'm upper bounding it hugely by like uh, m squared n. Right. So what's our reduction? Well, I'll say it this way. We see S i is going to be pairs of vertices. So v i vj and this i is going to is the same as this i uh, if the edge vi vj is not in e so basically si is the associated with the set of edges uh, 
for each vertex in the graph. So for example, if you have something like this, right, and this is one, then, and let's say this is uh, two, three, and four, then S1 will equal uh, S1, comma, one comma two, uh, one comma three, and one comma four, and then like S four would equal uh, four comma one, which is just one comma four. I read it as one comma four. So clearly, we have our reduction here to the independent set problem. Independent set. Excuse me, a reduction from independent set to set pack. Uh, if some u is in SI intersect SJ, U is then a pair, one index is an I and one index is a J. So that implies then that uh, VI, VJ uh, is in G. Uh, so not in our independent set, not in V prime. Similarly, if we have like uh, some VI and vj in our independent set we know that uh vi uh, vj if vi and vaj do not share an edge then vi vj is not in uh, si and it's also not in sj so this is uh, how the reduction goes our selection of sets is pairwise independent only if we had a independent set in the graph g This is called a feedback vertex set. I think CARP calls this feedback node set, but basically given a directed, dra uh, a directed graph G and K, uh, can you delete K uh, V, we'll say K uh, vertices from, uh, from G to make it a cyclic, right? A direct a directed graph can have more structure to it and be a cyclic compared to an undirected graph. If you might recall, here's a here's a uh, directed graph with no cycle. So if this was an undirected graph, that would obviously be a cycle of three. But because it's directed, there's no uh, there's no cycle. So this would be in a cyclic directed graph. Again, this is NP complete. So why? First, let's prove it's an NP. Uh, feedback vertex set is in NP. Why? Your certificate is going to be the set of vertices which you delete from G to make it uh, a cyclic. So delete the vertices. That takes O of n time. Uh, you also are deleting the adjacent edges, right? So that could take up to O of n squared time. Then you have to examine the graph to see if it's a cyclic, and that also is polynomial. So the whole thing is just going to be polynomial, so it's an NP. So here's the claim. Uh, if G is a directed graph, uh, construct, uh, I'll use a double arrow, uh, such that uh, if you had a, if this was an edge in G, in G one way, then double it in uh, G double arrow, right? In G double bar. Basically, we're constructing an undirected graph from a directed graph. I'm going to reduce from vertex cover to FES. So vertex cover is polynomial time reducible to uh, FES. And recall vertex cover, we choose some set of vertices such that no two are adjacent, but every edge is connected to uh, a vertex in the vertex cover. So here's the claim. V prime is a vertex cover of uh, the graph if and only if a V prime is a feedback vertex set of G double arrow. By the way, this double arrow can be represented as a cycle. Right? You can think of it like this. So this is a cycle of length 2. So um, let's do this one a little more rigorously. A little more rigorously. Let's do the forward way first. So assume not, actually. So that there exists a cycle in uh, V 
minus V prime. So it, this is not a, a feedback vertex set. It actually, there's still some cycle in uh, G double arrow. So pick any two adjacent uh, vertices. It's called U uh, V in this cycle. So if uh, UV is in this cycle, then it's explicitly not in V prime. So then that would imply that V prime did not cover some edge. So either U or V was not uh, in V prime. So either U or V is not in uh, V prime. So U comma V is not covered by the vertex cover. So V was not a vertex cover. Similarly, the other way. We assume that uh, V prime is a feedback vertex set of, of double G, and we're going to show that that must imply that V was also a vertex cover of the singular direction. Again, we're going to suppose not. So then V is uh, FES of G, but V prime would not be a vertex cover. So let some edge U comma V be in uh, our singular directed graph. And we have that uh, neither... So then we have U and V are both not in uh, V prime. So this is an edge in our directed graph, which is not covered. So V prime is not a vertex cover. But since this was an edge in the forward graph, then we have that u uh, to v and v to u were edges in our double graph. So then we have a cycle, cycle of length 2. Boop. Boop. So uh, then... V prime was never a feedback vertex set. Contradiction. Let's do one last really good reduction. Uh, for it's called hand path. So we say that we have some uh, G is a directed graph and G as a uh, Hamiltonian. So path, a Hamiltonian path is a path where every vertex is in the path and the path does not cross itself. So for example, every lattice like object has a path. Uh, so we could do something like that. We could say like, oh look, I'm gonna go like this. So that's allowed, something is not allowed would be something like, and you go, this is allowed and this is not allowed. You can't go the, through the vertice twice. So uh, Hamiltonian path is and be complete. Now you might think, okay, I've proven like a million graph theory problems. What is stopping this one from uh, reducing to a graph theory problem? And I think CARP originally did pr uh, prove this towards... Uh, vertex cover, but the proof in SIPSER uh, reducing from 3SAT is far more interesting. So we're going to reduce from 3SAT. Uh, what's the proof idea? For each, uh, let's say that phi is in uh, CNF, 3 CNF form. So uh, we have some clauses C1 and C2, dot, dot, dot. Let's say to CK, and let's say uh, very our literals. Let's say our literals are from X1 dot 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 to let's say XN. So for each X1 to XN, we form a diamond graph of the following way.
So this is going to be the uh, the diamond for x1. But here's the catch. And then this is going to be the diamond for x2. And so on. All the way till we get to the diamond for xn. But the catch is, is in between each of these, we're going to have the number of vertices. Uh, we're going to have a chain of vertices corresponding to each clause. So we're going to have like something like this. It's going to go like this. So to zoom in, let's... Uh, We have our first node, we have a spacer node. So we've the first node, which comes in like this, goes out like this. Then we have this, what, what is it, what we call a spacer node. And then these two nodes are gonna correspond to C1, a spacer node. These two nodes are going to correspond to uh, C2, and so on. So there's going to be like uh, uh, 3K uh, plus 1 nodes in this sort of crisscross diagonal thing. Uh, then we're going to also add uh, a node for each clause. So we're going to have, uh, so this is going to correspond to C1, C2, dot, 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 to CK, All right? One for each clause. Then, uh, if X, uh, if XI is in CL, you're going to go into the gadget corresponding, uh, the two nodes corresponding to that CI at the position in the string to CI. And you're going to add in an arrow like this. It's going to go coming out into C1 and going in into the next one. And then if, uh, let's say, CI complement is in uh, CL, right? Because each clause, recall, has uh, led three. We're going to go into it still, but we're going to go backwards. So we're going to go this way. And then don't forget, there's going to be some like that and like that. So now, uh, here's the Hamiltonian path, right? So this is the start vertex. You're going to go through the diamonds all the way to the bottom, through the middle. So your path is going to look like da da da, or like, uh, and then that's one diamond. Or it could go the other way, da da da, that's the second diamond. And then you're going to take the clauses as you see them. That's essentially it. So uh, consider that phi is in uh, three set. So it is satisfiable. Then uh, if xi is true, uh, you're going to go its path to be this way. If xi complement is true, you're going to go its path to be the opposite way. And then at each uh, step, uh, choose to enter the clause states, uh, so cl. So that's our Hamiltonian path. So if c is satisfy, if phi is satisfiable, then we can obviously get all these through the diagonal, but then xi is in C1 means that we have a path into the state C1. So recall, it's a Hamiltonian path. So basically, that implies every clause is... Because every clause is satisfied, every node is satisfied. Every node here is obviously satisfied, but these nodes are only entered through the Hamiltonian path if phi was satisfiable. All right, this way, the ham path... 
goes through the CI nodes only if CI clause was satisfied. So what about the other way? Uh, given the ham path, we can reconstruct the satisfying assignment. We can uh, reconstruct Right, you just sort of check each direction which one it goes. As a quick aside, uh, because each of these clause nodes is going to go to three diamonds, what's stopping you from doing the following path? Uh, we'll do dotted. You go, and then you jump to some bottom one, and then you continue. The reason this is prevented is because then this node here, these nodes here, are not in the Hamiltonian path. So it's not a Hamiltonian path. That's just like a normal path. The final step, which I should be remembering to do this first, ham path is clearly in NP. You just your the certificate is the path, so the certificate is the path. You just go uh, check that the size of the Hamiltonian path is the size number of you check that the you check that the size of the Hamiltonian path is the number of vertices in the graph, so therefore it touches every vertice, and you check no vertice goes through more than once. All this can be done in poly polynomial time. Very simple. In finality, let me just give you every reduction we gave today. So first of all, we have the king, we have sat. That was the cook Levin theorem. Then we had three sat. This was also proved by Cook. Uh, from three set, we gave two problems. From three set, we gave two problems directly. We gave clique and we gave ham path. Then from then from clique, we gave two problems. We gave a vertex cover, and we gave independent set. From vertex cover, we gave feedback uh, vertex set, and we also gave uh, set cover. And from independent set, we gave set packing. So this is a huge group of NP-complete problems. This is not the full set that Carp proved, but I chose uh, some more interesting ones, I think. Each of these was a polynomial reduction. From sat to three sat, then three sat to clique, then from clique to vertex cover, and then uh, finally to FVS. So if I were to compose these, I could actually give a direct reduction from FVS to SAT. But it'd probably be really bad. Imagine writing that as a program, right? You have like eight functions, and you're merging them into one big one. Doing it this way is a lot better. Um, you may use any of these further for reduction. So there's probably a thousand NP complete problems out there. This so this tree is just bigger and bigger and bigger, and they all come back to SAT.